Now, for those of you who are badgers like I am, I have both my undergraduate and graduate degree from UW-Madison, will get the Update magazine. And when I got this issue this fall, I said, I know this guy. I just got this guy to come and speak to good ideas. Uh, <laughs> our speaker today, uh, Will Sue, uh, is a business badger with Wisconsin roots. Lots of roots. Uh, <laughs> you know, Asian ginseng has been used by the Chinese and other cultures for thousands of years, but American ginseng was only discovered in North America about 200 years ago. Today we're going to learn more about ginseng in our Ginseng 101 presentation from Will Sue, who is also the Vice President of Operations for Sue's Ginseng Enterprises Incorporated. He grew up in Wausau. He graduated from Wausau East High School in 1994 with an IB diploma. Uh, Joyce Greasy, I think he graduated before you were in charge of IB, but, uh, uh, so, but with the IB. He matriculated at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2000 with honors and a triple major. You know, some of us had problems with one major. He did a triple major in finance, Chinese language, and literature, and East Asian studies. Uh, he's worked at General Mills, uh, got his MBA from that little college out east called Harvard, uh, where he got an MBA. Uh, you know, they, they've always kind of teased that UWMC was kind of the Harvard of the Midwest. Uh, you know, we were tough here, we had high standards, uh, but he went to the real Harvard. Uh, in 2011, he came back to Wausau to, uh, to engage with his parents and help them out in the family business of, and uh, his dad, uh, Paul Sue, was not able to join us today. He was hoping maybe dad could come along. Um, but we are very pleased and very happy to have with us our badger, uh, our business badger with Wisconsin roots, Will Sue. Good morning, Will. Thank you, Vicki. I've always wanted to speak at Harvard, so Harvard of the Midwest. <laughs> Perfect warm-up opportunity for me. Uh, I'm sorry Paul couldn't join us today. Uh, he might still be sleeping. No, I'm kidding. Uh, he's been uh, pretty busy. He was in Canada last week and then went down to Ohio to pick up some wild ginseng. So uh, it's been a busy week for us as we kind of move through this uh, that tail end of the harvest season. But today I'm here to speak to you about uh, the history of ginseng. I'm going to try to cover uh, about 2,000 years in 60 minutes. So uh, hopefully you can stay awake for it. Uh, it's not that boring, but it is, and it's. But uh, some people will find it quite interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about Asian ginseng, American ginseng, and pretty much everything in between that has ginseng associated with it. So without further ado, uh, this is my background. Vicky gave you some of it. Um, you know, my official title is vice president, but really at the end of the day, we're all farmers. Um, if you don't grow the crop, uh, our business doesn't really have a foundation to be built upon. Uh, I am the eldest son. I have two younger brothers. Uh, we all grew up here in Wausau. My, my two younger brothers went to West. Uh, my youngest brother, John, is a, a cardiologist, electrophysiologist at UC San Diego. Uh, and so he uh, is enjoying much warmer climates right now. Uh, you already know my educational background. Uh, I do really appreciate the education I received at UW-Madison. Um, I haven't been back in this building in a while, um, but I do remember going to college for kids here. So it's kind of nice to be back. <laughs> so I also, speak, I also uh, uh, serve on the board of directors for UW Foundation and Alumni Association. So that's uh, kind of one of the things that I do in my free time as well as volunteer at First Presbyterian Church uh, where I serve as an elder there. So I have my own cheerleading section over here. <laughs> so this is an aerial view of what many of you may see from the highway. Uh, unless you live next door to one or live out in the country where there's a garden uh, that was erected or has been erected or is being erected nearby. Uh, one of the interesting features about ginseng is that we do not grow on the same land twice. 
and I'll get into the reasons behind that. Uh, but once you have a garden there, we don't go back, and we haven't gone back in over 40 years uh, of growing. These are some uh, earlier plates uh, taken of ginseng drawings, uh, depictions of the plant. Um, you'll see, I'll show you some real color photographs earlier, but these are some of the early documents that people had to work from to identify uh, botanically the plant. And then there is a picture of a very well taken care of root. That one actually came from our fields a few years ago. So let's uh, take a step back in history. Uh, the global history of ginseng, the first recorded um, description of ginseng and its usage uh, appears in a classical traditional medicine text, the Shenong Ben Cao Jing. Um, it was really kind of one of the, it's kind of the Bible of tri traditional Chinese medicine. It depicts a lot of the herbs and the products and plants that were used in early China, uh, particularly in the Han Dynasty. And the reason why it's important is because the Han Dynasty is located primarily around northern China. Uh, and you'd only find ginseng in some parts of North Korea uh, and the, nor the, far uh, the most northern parts of China. Uh, and as the Chinese dynasties continued to migrate southward uh, to Xi'an, Nanjing, and other locales further south, uh, they became more and more distant from some of those earlier texts um, that really prescribed the use of uh, ginseng and other products. They continued to use it, but because of the distance and the rarity of the plant, uh, it was really reserved for royalty. Um, so Rensen uh, is the Chinese character for ginseng. Um, and it's kind of interesting how, this, uh, how the English word ginseng is derived. Some people believe it comes from rensen itself, but if you actually pronounce rensen, it doesn't really sound like ginseng. It kind of does, but not really. There's a lot of us who believe that what first happened is uh, Europeans first kind of heard about ginseng through exchanges with Japan. Now, Japan was much more open to European influences much earlier than China was. China really didn't open up its doors until the Ming and the Qing dynasties in the kind of 14, 1600s through the 1700s. Contact with Japan was much earlier than that. Uh, Japan was also further north, so had contact with Korea and northern China, and a lot of exchange of knowledge. Uh, even a lot of Japanese language uh, comes from um, the early characters come from Chinese as well as Korean. Korean ca characters also derive or originally from Chinese as well. Uh, and so because of that exchange of early knowledge as well as some shared heritage and culture, uh, the Japanese pronounce Zhensen as Jin Shen. And so a lot of us who have studied this really believe that Jingxing does not derive from Chinese Zhensen. It actually comes from English transliteration of the Japanese pronunciation of Jensen, which is Jinsen. Okay, you follow that? I'm an East Asian studies major, so that's my theory. Uh, Jensen traditionally refers to all ginseng species because at the time the word was created, there was only one known ginseng species, which is Asian ginseng. Uh, the Botanical classification is Panax C.A. Meyer, uh, Panax being the genus, C.A. Meyer being the species. It is of the family Aurelia Celia, Aurelia Cia. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but it is yang in nature. Uh, if you understand yin and yang, yang is uh, warming, uh, heating. And American ginseng, uh, as it coincidentally happens, is actually yin in nature. Uh, and so two different continents, two different species, uh, a shared genus, uh, but they, uh, you know, they are opposites, in fact, in terms of how they are used in traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, and the genus Panax, um, you know, which was derived from Western botanical descriptions, uh, contains all true ginsengs. There's a couple other types that are used. Uh, Tianqi ginseng is another one that is sometimes, uh, that some people have heard of. But Panax contains all true ginsengs. Anything that is not in the Panax family uh, is not technically a true ginseng. So about 20 years ago, you may have heard of Siberian ginseng. Siberian ginseng is actually Eleutherococcus. It is not a true ginseng because it is not in the Panax family. Uh, and Panax is derived from the Greek panacea, or which we call panacea, which is a cure-all. And so that's why 
Chinese ginseng, American ginseng is so coveted by a lot of both indigenous people as well as uh, Chinese culture because they do believe it can cure many ills. So some more about the history of ginseng. Um, after the late Han Dynasty, you have the uh, Shanglan Lun, which is a treatise on cold damage disorders uh, compiled by one of the preeminent early Chinese physicians, Zhang Zhongjing, around 200 AD. Um, and so you're talking about roughly 2,000 years ago, the Chinese were already starting to use ginseng and actually document its use. Because Chinese ginseng is heating, they used it as a fever relieving remedy. So when you ran a fever, the idea was to help your body kind of sweat it out. And if you think about a lot of traditional uh, med medicines, you know, sweat lodges, those type of things, when you have a fever, you don't treat it with cold, you treat it with more hot. Chicken soup, those type of traditional remedies. Um, you consume more heating things to help your body relieve itself of the fever rather than kind of do the opposite um, so that's the difference, I think, in Chinese traditional medicine is that they did use Asian ginseng as a stimulant or as a heating. Uh, and then because of the northern climate, it was often used in winter. It does help promote circulation. And so people who suffered from, you know, numbness in the extremities or poor blood flow to fingers, hands, toes, feet, uh, would often take ginseng to help stimulate circulation and blood flow um, to those areas of the body. Um, because of that, it also derived in some ways uh, a belief that it would help stimulate virility. And that is kind of what Westerners have assumed ginseng has been used for in Eastern culture. But in fact, if you follow traditional Chinese medicine, it was typically used as, uh, originally used as a cold uh, remedy. And there's actually quite a few traditional formula prescriptions uh, in the Shang Han Lun. Uh, and uh, nearly 20% of them contain references or usage of Chinese ginseng. Uh, so it is one of the, what they would call the king herbs uh, of early Chinese traditional medicine. And even to this day, many traditional Chinese formulas still use Asian or American ginseng uh, because of it. Um, and that has been Chinese med medicine up to present day. So for nearly 1,500 years, so from the Han Dynasty, as the dynasties continued moving south, uh, changed rulers, uh, et cetera, they continued to use ginseng, but because China was so isolated, uh, very little was written about it outside of Asian culture. Up until the Ming Dynasty, when China is probably the second great dynasty in the Chinese dynasties, the first one being, well, the third. First one being Han, the second one being Tang, the third one being Ming. Um, the Ming Dynasty really started opening up to Western influences or at least allowing Westerners in to study and research as well as share knowledge. Um, and that's kind of when uh, Westerners first started hearing about um, Chinese ginseng. And up until that point of time, there was only land routes available. And so you'd have to cross across, you know, the Gobi Desert or the traditional Silk Road in order to get to China. Very difficult. And until seafarers started landing on the coasts of East India, um, it was very difficult, obviously, to trade or exchange knowledge. The other piece that made uh, Asian ginseng difficult to understand is that it was reserved for royalty. Only the most um, senior officials, people in court, those close to the emperor, because of the rarity of the plant, were able to gain access to it. Uh, and it was really reserved for those who could afford it, so the affluent, um, those of high social standing, or those who had political power. So ginseng actually first appears in Western records near the end of the Ming Dynasty by the Italians, probably because of influences like uh, Marco Polo, as they are trading with the Chinese. Uh, the Italians were obviously some of the first uh, early uh, discoverers, both by land and by sea, um, to exchange information and trade with other cultures. Um, you don't hear much about it from really kind of 1600 until 1700 when Father Jarteau, a French Jesuit missionary, traveled to China to study extensively traditional Chinese medicine. That was his field of study, was kind of 
uh, indigenous peoples um, medicinal practices. And so he had heard that Chinese had a very strong culture of traditional medicine, um, and he wrote extensively about Asian ginseng after, after settling in China. Uh, he wrote two uh, that were obviously at that time very high publications. Uh, he wrote a uh, some illustrations in a memoir to the Royal Academy in Paris, you know, for those of you who studied uh, Western European history, obviously the Royal Academy being a, a center of uh, empirical knowledge at that time, but then it was also translated into English in the philo Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London, the Royal Society of London being another one of those um, probably highly educated societies uh, in 1711. Um, but through early 18th century, all records and documented uses of, uses of ginseng was of the Asian ginseng species because that was all that was known at that time. So let's talk a little bit before uh, about two, the two species of ginseng before we get into the history of American ginseng. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, American ginseng is Panax C.A. Meyer. Uh, or, sorry, Asian ginseng is Panax C.A. Meyer. American ginseng is Panax quinquefolius. Uh, C.A. Meyer is named after, is pretty much the guy who is credited with discovering, quote unquote, Asian ginseng. So the European who, uh, <laughs> discovered Asian ginseng, and so he named it after himself. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, American ginseng is Panax quinquefolius. Uh, those who named American ginseng actually took a different approach. Uh, they named it after the plant. Uh, quin meaning five, folius meaning leaves, so it is a five-leafed plant, um, and so they named it Panax quinquefolius. Usage of the two species differs dramatically. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Asian ginseng is considered yang, or warming, stimulating. Uh, American ginseng is considered yin, cooling, or tonifying. Uh, and so this is one of the interesting, I would say, m more recent aspects of trade with the ginseng is that Americans, if you think about the culture we are, we are a stimulant culture. We like caffeine in the morning. Um, we like um, warm things, um, and American ginseng is neither of those. Asian ginsengs, on the other hand, especially those that consume a significant amount of ginseng in southern China, prefer cooling or tonifying. They drink hot beverages all year round. Uh, but they also need products that help cool them, but things that they can take daily. American culture is very much, I'm sick, I don't feel well, I go to the doctor, I take a prescription, I get better, I don't take things on a day-to-day -day basis other than maybe a multivitamin. Asian culture is vice versa. They believe in prevention, they believe in taking herbs and other products daily to prevent you from getting sick. So there's a very much a philosophical difference in how we approach medicine. Therefore, there's a philosophical difference in how we consume ginseng. Most of the ginseng consumed inside of the United States is of the Asian variety. It's used in energy drinks. Uh, it's used in colas. It's used in diet drugs uh, or diet pills to help burn fat um, because it stimulates uh, your body's um, uh, circulatory system, as well as your ability to burn calories. Majority of the ginseng consumed in Asia is American ginseng. <laughs> Even though they have thousands of years of history of Asian ginseng usage, they consume on average more American ginseng because they take it daily. Asian ginseng by Chinese usage is either prescribed, it is considered a drug, uh, whereas American ginseng is considered over the counter or like a multivitamin. You can self-prescribe up to a certain dosage. And that is really the biggest difference between how Americans and Asians use ginseng to this day. So, I say the world balances itself out. Uh, and we wouldn't be around if it weren't for uh, this trade and this, this desire for different cultures to have different things. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but ginseng does typically grow around the 45th parallel around the world. That includes the U.S., some parts of Canada, China, and Korea. And so to this day, most of the major agricultural production areas for ginseng, whether it be the Asian species or the American species, uh, happens around the 45th parallel. And we have such great modern technology that today, here in Marathon County, we are growing Asian ginseng. And in China, in the northern parts of China, they are growing American ginseng. <laughs> but I will tell you, it is not the same 
We'll get into that later. Uh, ginseng was used by the Iroquois and other native tribes at the time of its discovery in the New World. So was it really discovered? No, it was just discovered by Europeans. Uh, Jesuit, and so the, the, the uh, individual who was kind of cited with that is Father Lafitau. Father Lafitau, if you read his history, very interesting individual. Uh, he was a Jesuit missionary. In 1718, he actually stumbled upon it uh, after reading an earlier writing uh, on, Asia, on Asian jinxing. Uh, Father Jarteau, who I mentioned earlier, traveled to China. He had published those works, had some illustrations printed. Father Lafitau remembered reading them and deduced, well, maybe North America, given its, given its climate, especially French Canada, could have jinxing. And if it did, that would be really interesting for trade. And so he was actually an early ethnographer who was observing the Iroquois and also studied some medicinal practices of the native tribes in French Canada. Thus, he had a lot of respect for Father Jarteau. Um, because of his belief of suitability, he worked with some Iroquois and Mohawk herbalists or healers in what would then be the St. Lawrence River Valley area, uh, southern Quebec, uh, parts of French Canada, to search for and eventually identified some plants and took some botanical plates, basically drawings that he then submitted uh, back to France. Uh, so he is credited with that discovery of American ginseng. Uh, and he noticed that it wasn't quite the same, but the plant looked eerily similar. Um, my dad has a belief that uh, if we all believe that the uh, world was once one continent, the species was originally the same, uh, and because of different growing conditions, it modified itself over time. Uh, as the continents drifted apart, the species evolved differently based on the climates and the locations. And the plants have, are very similar in nature, but they seed at different times. Uh, the plant leaves are slightly different. The roots look very similar, very difficult to tell, tell apart without the plant tops. Uh, but we all believe that it was originally the same species and just evolved differently because of the divide of the continents. So after the discovery, the French did what the French do in colonies. They started trading it. They hired uh, Native Americans and others to hunt for it in the woods, uh, dry it, which is the main, main way of preserving it, and started trading it along some of the primary fur trade routes. So across the ocean to France, from France to Asia, and then traded for silver, tea, and other products. Well, guess what? The British heard about this. And pretty soon in the British colonies, they discovered ginseng, growing in areas like upstate New York, Vermont, West Virginia, and other parts along the East Coast at elevation. So the British did what they do really well, which is trade it. And they started harvesting it out of the woods, um, paying trappers and other people, Western frontiersmen, uh, to start harvesting it, bring it to port in New York, and ship it to the British colonies, which they dominated at a time, which were Hong Kong and Guangzhou. Uh, so those were the free trade areas uh, where the British had the, probably the most influence and where Europeans in general had the highest influence in China. So to this day, the main trading ports for ginseng in Asia are still Hong Kong and Guangzhou. Um, there is one third city right now, uh, which was actually originally a Portuguese settlement called uh, Puning, uh, which is right along the coast there, and that's a smuggler's port. Uh, the Portuguese. So I can say that because I'm Taiwanese. We were colonized by the Portuguese. Taiwan was a big smug smugglers colony as well. So Guangzhou, Canton. It's also in southern China, right across the board, uh, just north of uh, Hong Kong. So the U.S. westward expansion opened up new frontiers for wild ginseng harvesting and farming as the country grew. Uh, and so we start seeing some early farming of ginseng, um, small plots, and even in France, they took seeds and started trying to plant them. But it is not an easy crop to grow. Uh, most of those early attempts did not succeed. So wild ginseng and fur, because of you can't grow it commercially, continued to be traded commercially and worked together for nearly 200 years until the late 19. 90s. Um, anyone who was trading in furs pretty much traded in wild ginseng at the same time. Because when you were out trapping animal pelts in the early fall, you were also out in the woods hunting wild ginseng. Both were major sources of income for people who lived out in the woods uh, and were items that were highly desired and could fetch a high price based on market conditions. 
And this is one of the main reasons, because if you look at American westward expansion, where wild American ginseng grows is pretty much the entire area that, that uh, the British colonies took over up until the Mississippi River. And as the U.S. continued expanding west, it was something they continued to find throughout the pristine forests of, North, of the United States. T today, uh, wild American ginseng is only available to be harvested in 19 states uh, and the Menominee Indian tribe. They are the only non-state um, or non 50 state that has the ability to legally harvest, sell, and export it commercially. It does appear in about five or six other states, but either the plants are, um, you know, the plant population is not sizable enough that they allow legal harvest, or the states have not, do not allow the harvest at all. Michigan is one of those states which actually has a, uh, a decent amount of wild ginseng, but they ban the harvest of all wild ginseng in the state. Canada banned the harvest of wild ginseng with the exception of First Nations tribes uh, in 1989. Uh, Quebec to this day, being Quebec, has a total ban on any trade in ginseng, and that happened since 1979. So you cannot buy, trade, sell any type of wild ginseng, including the imported from the United States in the, in the province of Quebec to this day. Uh, part of that has to do with that was one of the first place it was, places it was founded. They're trying to protect the species, but there was a lot of commercial over harvest of it in the 17 and 1800s. And so they have completely banned the trade of any ginseng to protect the species. Um, the reason why is because it is technically listed as a threatened species. Uh, they fear that over harvesting of the wild population will lead to it eventually becoming endangered or extinct. So there are both state and federal laws go governing the harvest and protection of the plant. Um, the commercial trade and export of wild American ginseng is estimated at about 30 million annually, but that doesn't really take into account the multiplier effect. Wild ginseng on average trades hands three to five times before it ever gets exported. So you have to multiply that number probably by three to five X. Uh, it is a very big business for a lot of poor areas of the United States. Uh, if you think about Appalachia and that area of the United States, this is a major source of income for many of those individuals. Uh, and that leads to reality TV shows. <laughs> so I don't care if you're moonshining or illegally harvesting wild ginseng, uh, they like to put it on TV. Uh, and because of some of that pressure, those of us who work in this trade are concerned about the eventual extinction or threatening of this species. Um, there are very strict laws in place. Um, there's one firm actually here in the state of Wisconsin three years ago that was fined a quarter million dollars and had all of their wild ginseng forfeited to the government uh, because of uh, illegal activities. Okay. Not, so how much inventory did they forfeit? About a quarter million dollars as well. So it is a very big business uh, for those individuals, but because of the history and heritage of it, um, individuals who dig wild ginseng don't like being governed by laws. They believe God put the plant there, and if they find it, it is their God-given right to dig it. If it's on national park, state park, somebody else's property, they found it. And that's a very hard uh, habit and culture to break, uh, given that we've had nearly 200 years of history of digging this plant. And you learn this just like you learn hunting or fishing. You don't find this plant by walking through the woods. You have to find this plant because someone trains you or teaches you how to find the plant in the woods. A lot of people think, oh, this is great. I can go out next, next fall and hunt some wild ginseng. I will tell you, I've stood in many places where I can see three, four, five plants, and anyone who's ever ne never seen ginseng before, never hunted it before, will all, all this sees green. Okay, it's a very difficult plant to spot in its native climate, uh, but it also doesn't repopulate itself very quickly. So because of that, it was listed on the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species uh, in 1979, and that governs and restricts the trade of this species without a whole lot of paperwork. Uh, and so if you can't do the paperwork, don't want to do the paperwork, it, it would be considered smuggling or illegal export uh, of this product. Some of that still happens to this day, but I will tell you that the fines for it are federal. Uh, and the prosecution for it is held by the Department of the Interior under the Division of uh, 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 the Department of Fish and Wildlife Services. So they're not joking around. Uh, the main export market is still Hong Kong and East Asia, including Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, China, and Vietnam. Uh, this shows you the wild ginseng harvest over the last 
you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, because of the popularity recently, especially on reality TV, uh, you see 2013 and 14 are record years of harvest in the last decade. And this is what uh, the Department of the Interior and the uh, Division of, or uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife Services is really worried about. Um, and this has also driven up prices for the product as well. And so you put those two items together and you have potentially a threat to the ongoing harvest. Uh, my guess is in the next 10 or 15 years, unless there is significant repopulation of the plant, uh, they will start going to a limited harvest. So a quota system, a lottery system like they do with bear tags and other individuals, or they will restrict the amount that you're able to harvest or sale. Um, they already do a lottery system in a lot of state and national parks in the south, uh, including at, uh, I think it's Daniel Boone uh, National Park. There are certain sections that they section off for people to uh, purchase permits, but those are given out on a lottery system and it restricts the amount that you can harvest. So the largest producing states are still Kentucky, uh, and Tennessee and North Carolina. Um, Wisconsin is right up here in the, light, in the dark blue. Um, we do roughly 1,500 to 2,500 pounds annually. Uh, we are one of the larger dealers here in the state. Uh, we do about half of that, so about 750 to 1,200 pounds of wild ginseng a year. Uh, dried equivalent is what we are purchasing from diggers and harvesters throughout the state. Um, the major producing areas, uh, well, I'll point out one other thing. You also see the Menominee tribe was added here in barely in 2012, 13, and 14, uh, but they actually outproduced two other states, Maryland and Vermont. So the county of Menominee <laughs> actually outproduces two other states on the East Coast in terms of their wild jinx and product, protect, uh, production, and that's because of how well they've protected their forests there. And so the, one, the, a lot of people talk about over-harvest, but really, the major threat that no one wants to talk about is uh, cutting down of trees, um, expansion of commercial and residential housing, um, and those are all things that uh, harvesters can't control. As people sell land, farms, forests, um, the plant will continue to see other pressure outside, outside of harvest. So it's been found in Wisconsin forests for hundreds of years. I mentioned that the single largest producing county in the state of Wisconsin is technically Menominee. Uh, but the Menominee is a separate nation state, and so it is protected, and they have different laws. Um, to leave the county of Menominee with wild ginseng, you have to have an export certificate from the tribal, count, from the tribal administration uh, in order to sell it, and they do outproduce two states. Uh, the majority of the state harvest from, comes from southwestern Wisconsin. If you take the 90, uh, Interstate 90, that crosses around um, La Crosse down through Madison, Everything southwest of there is the major producing area. Probably three quarters of the wild ginseng in this state comes from that area. A lot of people refer to it as the driftless area. Okay? Uh, and that has to do with the end of glaciation. So uh, anything that had glacial coverage um, does not have a ton of wild ginseng because the belief is it, the glaciers either killed the wild ginseng or pushed it south. And so everything south of that glacial edge is where most of the ginseng in the state of Wisconsin occurs. Uh, it also occurs naturally in Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois, at least in the Midwest, and then another 15 states outside of that. The Wisconsin Deep Department of Natural Resources writes both the administrative code and charged with enforcing state and federal laws. Uh, they do a very good job of that. We are probably one of the best governed states. Uh, so I know a lot of people sometimes have hard feelings about the DNR, but uh, for those of us who work in the wild ginseng industry, uh, they regulate it very heavily and we uh, agree and understand why they do it that way. Um, we are probably the model state in terms of licensing, in terms of administration, in terms of prosecution and enforcement of wild ginseng laws. Uh, and then the National Harvest, as I mentioned, is managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. So to this day, we're still foraging wild ginseng. I have a wild ginseng harvester's permit. Uh, I dig about two or three pounds dry a year. Uh, you do have to buy it from the DNR. It's about $16, I think, if you're in state. Uh, the harvest season is from September 1st to November 1st. You need to hunt for it on primarily private lands, uh, either your own or with permission on somebody else's. It is illegal to harvest on any state or federal lands in Wisconsin, although we know it does happen. Uh, the mar and here the reason why is because the market price is $150 to $200 per pound fresh. Not carrots. 
Uh, and then it dries down about three to one or three and a half to one. So the equivalent is about 500 to $700 a pound dry. Now you understand why there's so much pressure on this plant. Uh, I will show you pictures and you will maybe be able to tell the difference. It, it grows differently. Just like anything that grows on a farm, it grows faster and quicker and bigger and faster. Uh, wild ginseng is still a federally protected species threatened uh, due to overharvest, and I mentioned the reality TV. I don't need to go into that. Here's what it looks like in the wild, if you can find it, <laughs> if you can differentiate it from all the other green stuff next to it. So it's the one in the center. It's this one, five leaves. One, two, three, four, five. And then this is a three leaf prong. This is not ginseng. This is not ginseng. None of this is ginseng. Uh, on the left side here, you have a four prong plant, which is very, it's hard to find these, uh, a plant this size in the wild. Uh, normally they only develop about three prongs. So this would tell me that this plant is probably at least 10 years old. Um, it's a very slow developing, slow maturing plant. Uh, and then here's what the root looks like when it's dug up. So this root was laying primarily horizontally. Uh, you see another tap root developing. This typically happens after about 10 years. So this was the main root that developed from the seed. This tap root is kind of what we call a second generation in case the main tap root dies off or rots off or gets um, diseased. It can still grow from the secondary tap root and you can start seeing it seeing that it's starting to already develop the third generation here. Uh, so the, off of these feeder roots. And that's what, how it does is it just continues growing year after year after year. You can find plants in the wild that are 20, 30, 50, 75 years old. It's an amazing plant that can, that can continue to survive for that many years, year in and year out, which is why if you over harvest it, um, I'll talk about the production cycle and why that's such a big deal if there is a lot of over harvest because it does not mature and seed very quickly. So that's part of the cultivated story. Um, cultivated ginseng here in central Wisconsin has a great history. Uh, those of you who study the Fromm brothers or the history of the fur industry know that Edward, John, and Henry wanted to breed foxes. They actually, to get the money, they started by transplanting 150 plants from the wild because there was no Wisconsin DNR at that time. That's technically illegal. <laughs> by 1919, they actually had 60 barrels of ginseng worth, at that day, probably about 45,000, which 1960, $45,000 is a lot of money. Uh, and they used a lot of that initial money to buy and breed fox and then mink. Um, they were the largest ginseng operation in the world uh, for many years. They had hundreds of acres of land up there off of County Highway F uh, and um, very well respected uh, family in that area. They obviously became famous for silver fox pelts, and they dominated that industry until World War II when the market dried up, and that was both for fur and ginseng. The major markets for fur also were in southern China as the Japanese uh, took over China and invaded China, and the war dragged on and on and on. Those ports closed down for trade. Fur was still traded into Europe, but Europe was also in war, and so the trade for fur was also difficult. And what did the Fromms do? Well, they were lucky that they had enough wealth that they could just basically put up the furs and put up the ginseng until the end of the war. They kept growing it uh, and just barreled it and the product survives three, five, seven years in storage without much deterioration if it's stored in good conditions and they just waited until the war ended and then they shipped it over and uh, reopened the trade. Uh, they dominated the industry from pretty much the end of First World War up through the late 1980s when the family started having um, generational differences of opinion on how to handle the business and uh, kind of divided up the empire. Um, I think the last remaining aspect of the Fromms is the pet food business down in Mequon. Uh, other than that, uh, you have the uh, preservation society that's trying to keep the home farm uh, open and um, that's about the end of the story of the Fromms, but a really important uh, part of central Wisconsin history. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen to the Sioux family. We'll see. <laughs> we don't quite dominate the industry yet, but um, I got two younger brothers. Maybe we can have a fight. <laughs> so this is actually a picture of uh, the Fromm farm uh, from the, early, I think, right around 1930s or 1940s. Um, you'll see that most of the people in the field are women. 
Uh, they used the women's labor to harvest seed. Um, the men would a lot of times take care of the animals, uh, and they used the women primarily to do the, the hand labor involved uh, for ginseng. To this day, all the weeds are still pulled by hand. The seeds are all picked by hand. Nothing has changed in 100 years. So trust me, I grew up doing it. <laughs> so that shows you one plant under artificial shade with a fully developed seed bulb and a fully developed root, probably four or five years old. Okay, um, So you see all those seeds there, all picked by hand. Uh, without Hmong labor in the 70s and 80s, this industry would have been dead. Most people won't admit it, but uh, without Hmong labor that came in to help with the harvest of seed and root, this industry would not have survived. Um, and so it's one of those things where in, if you're inside the industry, I think you acknowledge that. If you're outside of the industry, you may have no idea. But we employed hundreds uh, of Hmong, we still do to this day, um, because of their ability to do farm work and farm labor. Um, not many people want to do farm work anymore. So I mentioned the ginseng life cycle and why it takes so long and why it is so difficult to harvest this crop. These are those red berries you saw earlier. We'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say I pick those in August of last year, 2015. We then depulp them and dry them down into seeds. But these seeds cannot be planted yet. They must be what we call stratified. So we bury them in sand over winter. They will develop and sprout after we plant them next summer. They won't develop into a first year seedling until spring of 2017, okay? 2015 August, planted in July of 2016, you get three leaves in 2017, okay? Still not ready to be harvested. 2018 now, three year old root, you probably need some money because you've also had to do this. Plant some more seeds, develop another year. You've had three years of this with no income. So, so you may harvest some of these. If you don't harvest these, then you wait for what we prefer to, which is a four-year plant. A four-year plant is actually five years from seed, which means that 15, 16, 17, 18, 2019. So the question is, how long are you wait, willing to wait for the return on your money? This is a very, it can be a very lucrative industry for those who enter it, but it's high risk. You're farming, and you don't get a crop every year unless you plant every year. And if you don't replant every year and reinvest every year, you don't get a crop every year. And as soon as you have one bad crop or two bad crops or a bad market, uh, you may decide to exit. Uh, I currently estimate that the average cost to plant if you're starting from scratch with no, I mean, let's just say you borrow some tractors or whatever else, because I'm not going to count tractor and you know, other machinery that you have to buy. But let's just say you want to buy, buy some land or rent some land and then plant this. $10,000 to plant one acre your first year. About 8000 to spray chemicals and maintain the fields with labor, hand weeding, straw, pay your rent, Second year, probably same amount. So, so by the time you've done it, you've probably invested somewhere around 40 grand for one acre before you've harvested a single root. And hopefully you haven't had anything die. Hopefully you can grow it well. Hopefully you've sprayed the right chemicals. Hopefully you haven't had a natural disaster. In the meantime, you were also supposed to spend $10,000 every year planting the second and the third year of the crop. It's a very significant capital investment. Uh, and that doesn't count farm buildings, washing technology, drying technology in order to actually finally process the crop. So this is why this tends to be a multi-generational type of enterprise. If you don't have the start, if you don't ha understand how to grow it, you're never going to get into it and you don't have the capital or the ability to grow the product. Um, in fact, I talked about the Hmong. The Hmong learned how to grow it by working in the fields. They are one of the new generation of farmers that are coming up. Uh, Paul and I are trying to support them because that's how Paul got his start as well. Um, and we know that without the, their, you know, what, we, uh, what they gave to the industry in the past and what they're doing now, this industry won't continue to survive. 
uh, because you do need another generation of farmers to come in. There's not many young farmers like me. There's probably 150 farmers left uh, in this industry uh, and probably a dozen of us who are under the age of 40. So out of a normal acre of jinxing, if you do it well, you can get 2,000 pounds. If you don't do it well, you can get zero. Okay. The historic yield here in Wisconsin, central Wisconsin has been about 12 to 1,500 pounds an acre. At today's prices of 50 to $60 a pound, you might get, say, 50 to a good market, maybe $100,000. So let's say on average, $75,000. So after you put in 40, 50, $60,000, you get $75,000 four years later. So it is still farming. Um, but it can be more lucrative uh, if you have a history of doing it and you can do it with better yields. And that's true of any farming. So here's some more pictures of the plant. This is all cultivated. That's uh, the three-year-old, the, sorry, the three-leafed one-year-old. This is artificial shade. Uh, it's a black canvas fabric or black plastic kind of fabric. Um, also artificial shade. This is a four-year-old plant, so you see much bigger seed development, much bigger plants. And then this is what it looks like in winter. This is actually under wood shade. So some folks who plant smaller gardens use wood shade. Wood shade is more effective, tends to have higher yield, higher seed, better aeration, but it's very difficult to put up because you're basically lifting pallets above your head all day long. So we'll talk about the golden age of ginseng in Wisconsin. Uh, demand continued to grow from 1940 to 1990. Uh, prices and output peaked in the early 1990s. Uh, a couple of millionaires or a few millionaires were made here in the four county region. These four counties still account for over 90% of the ginseng production in the United States. And almost all of it, or at least a significant majority of it, is in Marathon. And it has to do with the weather, the climate, and the soils of this area. Or what the, if you drink wine, what we will often refer to as terroir. Okay. It imparts a specific taste to the ginseng root, more so than wine, because wine is a fruit. It's developed from the grape. Roots grow in the ground. The best thing I can tell you is when someone tastes jinx and they say it tastes like dirt. Exactly. <laughs> My farm manager, Nick Sanquist, to this day still doesn't eat jinx and why? Because it tastes like dirt. And I told you, perfect, that's what we want it to taste like. <laughs> uh, it is a little bitter, but it does have an earthy flavor to it that some people don't like. So at the peak of the market in the late 80s and early 90s, you had 1,500 ginseng growers, accounting for over 90% of the U.S. production, 2.5 million pounds grown here in Wisconsin. Prices ranged from $40 to $60 a pound during that era. The largest farmers typically had maybe you know, 40, 50, 60 acres, nothing as big as the Fromms. Um, so at that point in time, it dumped about $100 million, over $100 million into this local economy. Well, anytime you make money, somebody else wants to make money too. Uh, in, so in Canada in the 90s, uh, farmers began growing ginseng in British Columbia from Wisconsin seed stock. So farmers here had extra seed, they wanted to make more money, they sold the seed stock to British Columbia. My dad's theory is you can only sell seed for three years, because at a certain point you develop your own plants and you don't need to buy seed anymore. And that's really what happened. They bought seed for three years and then they quickly built up capacity and then eventually flooded the market with over five million pounds of, of ginseng. The growing conditions in British Columbia are much better. Uh, it's much more mild, a much more mild climate, longer growing season, uh, a little bit more coastal influence, uh, and so the roots grow big fast. Um, so they, we average 12 to 1,500 pounds an acre here. They average 2,500 to 3,500 pounds per acre there. So it's the difference between high yielding and low yielding areas. Same with wine. Same with wine. Uh, but which tastes better? Low yielding. <laughs> so what happened? Canadian roots didn't look the same or taste the same, and consumers weren't happy, and so they stopped buying Canadian ginseng. But it already impacted the supply chain. Uh, and so right to this day, uh, there are very, probably only two, two farmers that we know of still growing in British Columbia. Okay, so they went from z maybe a couple farmers, so a few thousand pounds, to five million pounds, back to a few thousand pounds. Okay, very similar to uh, what happens in wine. Okay, you get a new producing area like Australia, they produce a whole bunch of wine, it's not really that great. People think it's cheap, it's fine, and then eventually they go back to what tastes good. Um, and we're seeing it today. Look at organic and uh, local food, right? 
Uh, 20 years later, like I said, very few ginseng farmers, almost all of them moved to Ontario. Why? Because the climate and the soils are more similar to Wisconsin. The taste is more similar, but still not the same. The look of the roots still not the same. Yields are still higher than Wisconsin because they're at the 42nd or 43rd degree parallel. So that two or three degrees of difference adds a couple weeks on each end of the growing season. Uh, they have sandier soils, so they get better uh, yield. So once Canada exited our British Columbia, a lot of guys sold seed to China. So China is now the third uh, growing area for American ginseng. It is the second largest. So Canada is the first largest still to this day, about five to six million pounds. Uh, China, the numbers are fuzzy. It's hard to tell. They don't publish them. We estimate two to three million pounds. Central Wisconsin produces less than a million pounds this, uh, annually and as low as 300,000. So that's what we're talking about right now. The 21st century, um, we, I mentioned Canada. Uh, people still want the product from central Wisconsin because it tastes better, uh, and I agree with that. <laughs> Self-interest. Uh, and uh, the planted acreage and number of growers continue to dwindle throughout the early 2000s. Um, so in 2007, um, less than when I was a year out of business school, less than 300,000 pounds and 150 growers. And you know, my dad was saying, "Are you going to come back?" And I, and, and we kind of talked to each other. And I said, "This is a dying industry. You know, 300,000 pounds, 150 farmers. Pretty soon, you're insignificant." Uh, anyone remember 2010 Mother's Day? Yeah. Snow. In some ways, it saved the industry because. Um, the, as it was very devastating weekend. Uh, those of us who had shade up, it all collapsed. Um, but what happened is the prices skyrocketed because yields were so low that year. And so there was still enough latent demand for the product that when you only produce three, 400,000 pounds and it's very difficult to get, the roots were not very large that year, so yields were down, uh, prices went up significantly, and it got some more folks interested in planting more. And so since 2010, the industry has been on in a recovery. Uh, people are planting more acres. You're probably seeing more gardens go up because prices have uh, been high. In addition, right around that time frame, we did a lot better job of marketing the roots to China, finding buyers, and locking up um, big companies to purchase large quantities. Without that demand for Wisconsin ginseng, my guess is um, by this time, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you about this industry. Uh, because no one would have, would have come back into this industry. So you're really seeing a revival and what might be the second golden age of ginseng here in central Wisconsin. Uh, a lot of that depends on China, though. And as Chinese economy continues to weaken, uh, as the U.S. dollar continues to strengthen, it will make it very difficult for some of the local farmers uh, to continue to get high prices and continue to expand production without having an impact on prices. So I'm going to use the last couple minutes to talk about our company because uh, it's a very interesting story, or at least I find it interesting. My dad was a first-generation immigrant to the United States. Um, he came to Wisconsin in 1972, I believe. He came to the U.S. in 69. Uh, he was a social worker for the state of Wisconsin, uh, stationed in Fond du Lac, heard about ginseng, started buying it from local farmers and mailing it to friends and family. Uh, his first foray into it, he bought a couple pounds, sent some home to my grandmother because my grandmother gave birth to 14 kids, uh, was in poor health in her 60s, and started taking American ginseng, and my grandfather wrote a letter back to my dad saying, it works, send more. <laughs> and so he didn't believe it, but he sent more as every good son does. And he didn't go back for a few years because it was too expensive to fly back home uh, until, until their 50th wedding anniversary. And he went back home for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, and he said his mom's health had improved significantly. Um, you know, she had some probably pre-diabetic conditions at that time. You know, medicine wasn't that advanced, um, digestive issues. But after taking ginseng, she had an appetite. She was able to, you know just get around better. And my dad didn't believe it, but when you're gone for you know, four or five years until you're able to go home, you see a difference when, you're, when you come home. Uh, and so from that point on in 74, he started selling uh, re basically mail order uh, to friends and family. Uh, people he knew spoke Chinese uh, and he would sell it to them. He'd buy it from a local farmer, grade it in his basement, uh, trim the roots, package it, and send it. Uh, and they would either send money or send money back, or you know that was back in the day when you kind of sent someone a check and hoped that you got something four to six weeks later. No instant email confirmation. 
So uh, we are, t you know, because of his uh, foresight and vision and persistence, uh, we are now farming about 200 acres of ginseng land in central Wisconsin. Uh, he started his first garden uh, north of Wausau on County Highway W in the town of Texas uh, between Wausau and Brokaw. We're still up there to this day. Um, we're vertically integrated from farm to retail. So we have our own website, we uh, have our own catalogs, our own sales force that basically markets and sells the product as well as processes the product to primarily Chinese customers. Uh, we're transitioning right now to a second generation of family ownership and management. Uh, my dad's first employee was Ron Sanquist. Uh, he was my dad's farm manager. Uh, Nick Sanquist, his son, is my farm manager. Um, and I am working for my dad. So who we are, we're still the, uh, the largest grower and retailer of ginseng in the United States. We're probably no longer the largest grower, but we are the largest grower and retailer because a lot of folks who grow the product here locally uh, do not actually retail it. They sell it to wholesalers or brokers who then sell it to end, uh, to processors or graders who will then process the product and prepare it for wholesale or retail sale. So it's still a commodity uh, locally, but we here, we have uh, about 100 employees in North America. Most of us are located in Wisconsin. Uh, that includes our farms, and some of you may have heard of a small division we have called Sioux Growing Supply, which does leaf composts and soils and mulches. Uh, that's an offshoot of our farm and uh, ginseng uh, ventures. So we have a global supply chain. We print about a million catalogs a year. Our catalogs and website cover about 5,000 SKUs. We have about 1,000 acres of ginseng farmland in central Wisconsin. Some of it has been used and is being swapped with other farmers who grow cash crops. Uh, and then the rest of it, we are farming, but you always have to, we do a lot of land acquisition, a lot of land sale swap, uh, because we constantly need to find new land that hasn't had ginseng grown on it. Uh, ginseng yields, the second time you grow on it, are very poor, five, 600 pounds per acre or less, uh, partly because of disease, partly because the root itself, uh, grown at high density, uh, extracts a lot of micronutrients and trace minerals from the soil. Uh, and for those two reasons, um, we do not plant on the, on the land a second time. Uh, but you can plant corn, soybeans, other crops on it, and they come up just fine. And the difference is corn and soybeans are not root crops. And that is the main difference. SKUs are stock keeping units, so those are number of, of, stock, of type of products that we carry. Uh, we also have a lot of international ventures. This is part of our global supply chain. We have six branch offices in North America that distribute the product into Chinatown markets. So if you go into one of these Chinatowns, if you're visiting, you may see our products on shelf there, uh, but primarily in Chinatowns. Uh, most of our processing has now been moved abroad to take advantage of lower labor rates. So we have a processing facility in the free trade zone in Zhang Jiagang. Uh, there's actually, I think, an exchange with Zhang Jiagang by Marshfield School District this year. Um, and then our headquarters for China operations are in Nanjing, which is in southern China. Uh, we have a small branch office in Hong Kong because that's a traditional trading port. And then because my dad is Taiwanese, he has to have an office in Taiwan to uh, export product to because it would be uh, sad if he didn't. Uh, and then we do have a branch in Guangzhou uh, because that is also a major, tra a major trading port. Um, but these are the major uh, markets for, uh, for, for American ginseng in Asia. So we have about 300 employees uh, worldwide. Uh, we also source a lot of products out of Asia, import them into the United States for Chinese customers that purchase our products uh, because they are difficult to find here in, here in the U.S. So this is the global supply chain I'm talking about. We grow and harvest the ginseng in Wisconsin. Once it's dried in our facilities, we have 19 kilns that each hold about 5,000 pounds dried when they're done uh, up on County Highway W. We export them to the free trade zone in Zhangjiagang, China. We have about 80 to 90 employees there that process ginseng 52 weeks out of the year other than vacation. Uh, so we're processing on average 4,000 pounds, up to 4,000 pounds of ginseng per week uh, in that processing facility. It is all done by hand, trimmed by hand, packaged by hand. Uh, it is then re-exported back to the United States for final sale. So this is the most well-traveled ginseng you will find. <laughs> and here's the crazy part, it then goes back over. People in, buy it here in the United States, bring it back over to Asia to send as gifts, or we re-export it as processed product. So 
ocean-going vessels. Uh, we also source a lot of other products from around, the U around Asia that use traditional Chinese medicinal herbs, uh, bird's nest or swiftlet nest from Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, some over-the-counter medicines uh, and food products from Taiwan and Japan, a lot of dry seafood products, uh, even things like canned abalone from Australia. So these are all products that are used in Chinese cuisine, Chinese cooking, and Chinese medicine. So this is a, a picture of some of our labor, washing roots. This is a very old picture because we don't do much processing here in the U.S., although Chong is one of our oldest employees, I think over 20, I think this year 25 years of service with us. Uh, she's actually trimming roots. Um, you see a pruning shears there, and that's how most of them are trimmed to this day. So they're all clipped. All those legs and arms are clipped off the root because they use primarily the body of the root. The, the tails and the fibers are used to make powders, extracts, other dietary supplement ingredients, or used to make tea. Uh, and tea bags. This is packaging of the roots, so all packaged by hand into trays. Um, and then that's what some of the finished product look like in packages. So in total, to go from seed to here, about seven years. Almost seven years. So a couple last facts and figures, because uh, I know I'm running out of time. First Chinese grower of American ginseng, uh, first Chinese mail order catalog probably in the United States. Um, so I don't know another major mail order catalog that hits Chinese households, Chinese speaking households here in the United States, plus catalogs are start, starting to go away. Uh, but we just still print about a million of them a year. Uh, we are still one of the largest farming operations. Uh, we do about 200,000 pounds of American ginseng a year. Um, about half of that is ours, about half of that comes from other farmers here in the four or five county region. We are still one of the largest US, U.S. brokers for wild American ginseng. As I mentioned, Paul was just in Ohio. We do about half of the wild ginseng here in Wisconsin and a few hundred pounds from other locations that our buyers or uh, customers in Asia ask for. They request specific states, Ohio, North Carolina sometimes, um, Tennessee, uh, because the roots are not the same depending on where they're grown. And we do do some woods grown ginseng. This is kind of a fun side project because we're worried about the, su the sustainability of wild ginseng is that we are starting to do a lot of woods grown ginseng which takes about eight to 10 years uh, to reach maturity. Uh, so it's a long-term project that we're working on because we know down the road, if there continues to be pressure, you need to have a substitute, and wood woods-grown ginseng is one of those substitutes, but you have to have a lot of patience um, because it grows in the woods and you can't keep the deer from eating it. <laughs> or the turkeys. So we are the uh, first and only CGMP, or good manufacturing pro uh, process compliant company in the United States. Um, again, it's a very niche industry, so it's easy to be the only one. <laughs> and uh, we have got about 500,000 unique visitors to our website every year. So that's what our website looks like. That's my dad. He's our spokesmodel because he doesn't charge anything. So he's very cost effective. Uh, this is a new product that we developed called American Gin Max. It actually takes uh, powdered extract. So we extract the active ingredient in ginseng, put it into a powder form, and then um, make a hard pressed tablet out of it. Because a lot of consumers, the traditional ways of consuming ginseng is cook it in soups, brew it in tea. It takes hours, if not overnight, to do that. Consumers want nowadays something fast, quicker. So if you go to our website, uh, you'll actually see that it comes in Chinese because Again, 90% of our customers are Chinese. Uh, it's unlike other websites, you actually have to flip it to English up here. <laughs> so uh, one last reminder, there is an International Jinxing Festival planned for September 15th through 17th in 2017. Uh, so you got a year and a half to get ready. Uh, but it's supposed to be held down on the 400 block, um, and we're one of the, we and the Jinxing Board of Wisconsin, the Jinxing Herb Co-op, and a couple other folks are going to be proud sponsors of this, so it'll be the first one um, in Wisconsin that we know of, uh, and the first one held here in Marathon County. So we hope it becomes, you know, an every year, every other year type of uh, festival to draw some tourists here into Wisconsin. So thank you for your time. I'll stay afterwards for questions if anyone has any questions.